news is tropical storm. Woo! You know? I love it. Hey! Oh, it. Installs canceled. Woo! Did that really Yes. Or rescheduled, my bad. It's all right. At least it's this yeah. time of year, you know? Yeah. You know, it's okay. It happens. It happens. Woo! Okay, stop all right. It. Stop. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Just stop. Well. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit this morning about some practical things that maybe get missed in the summer that we want to make sure that we reset and pay attention to in the fall and winter. And... Broadly speaking, like we've talked about a lot, if something does not become a habit, if you don't build it into your process, you will never do it. Um, and the, one of the nice things about being in the HVAC field is that you're not, you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder all the time, right? Who likes that? Who likes not having somebody look over their shoulder all the time? Hey, this guy. But the bad thing is, the bad thing is that you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder all the time, so if you get into bad habits, they just keep rolling with you. So, a few things. From a theory standpoint, what are some things that cause motors to run hot and or inefficient? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you guys make a list of things that cause a motor to run hot or in Efficient. Is that how you spell efficient? I before E except after G? Something like that? That, that rule doesn't apply. That anymore. doesn't work? It doesn't okay. Work. Yeah. There's no G. It doesn't either. make any sense. Yeah. Lower refrigerator. Bert, can you smack that phone out of Josh's hands? I'm taking notes. Though. Oh, you're taking notes. Okay. <laughs> Woo, that was close. <laughs> it is true. There's about, a phone, there's about a phone to be slapped across the room. All right. <laughs> The actual yeah. temperature of the motor itself. The motor, the what are some things hot. that cause a motor to run hot or inefficient? A low capacitor. A weak capacitor. Oh, you had a problem with low? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Wow. With respect for who we were just talking, I was just talking to my sister in law, Rachel, who's a missionary, by the way, about how youths are so disrespectful nowadays. We're talking all about you. Oh, <laughs> right? Wow. Wow. Not cool. All right. So we can pass for what else? Airflow. Airflow. Interesting one. We're going to do airflow, question mark. What do you actually know? Question mark. So under what circumstances does airflow cause a motor to run hot or inefficient? Not enough air, but like clogged. Okay, but we got to be really specific because this is not always true. Build up. Hmm. Build up on the things. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's yeah. So let's do that. If you have a dirty blower wheel. You know, Carlos. Or a clogged coil. Those are all things that can cause low air flow. <coughs> Double filter. Uh, okay, double filter. All right, we're, we're coming up with a lot of good ones here. Let's say a, a filter that's just too restrictive. Block to turn. All right, block to turn. Wrong size. Wow. It's just going to keep going. We're just going to go ahead and stop there. I really don't enjoy writing that much. It's one of my weaker topics. Writing. <clears throat> I think you just lost audio. I think that's what just happened. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so when we say airflow causes a motor to run inefficient or, because we're not talking about the system, we're talking about the motor. Does low airflow cause a motor to run inefficient or hot if it's a normal blower motor, so not an ECM blower motor, with a clogged evaporator coil. Did you hear what I just asked, Bert? Because I'm not getting any like response on your face. I actually didn't hear it. I'm recognition. Not. Okay, we're going to try it again. No so, does an airflow restriction on a regular PSC, does anybody know what PSC stands for? Permit split capacitor. Permit split capacitor, old school blower motor, not variable speed. Does an airflow problem like a restricted evaporator coil? cause that motor to run hot or inefficient? 
And the answer is no. No with a caveat. Because, of course, it is an air-cooled motor, so I'm sure there would come a point at which it would cause it to overheat. But with a traditional blower motor, when you have poor airflow, when you have high static pressure, does the motor draw higher current or lower current? Lower current. It draws lower current. So if you take an old-school air handler, old-school furnace, and you put a dirty filter in it, and you're monitoring the current of that motor, that motor will actually draw lower current because that motor, that blade design, is loaded based on airflow, meaning how, much, how many cubic feet of air, or how many pounds of air, more specifically, that motor is moving, not by static pressure. So the static pressure goes up, that motor is not working harder. It's working less hard. We're talking an old school motor. Now, flip the script, change it to a ECM motor, which is what a lot of you are used to nowadays, which is why it's sort of become a little forgotten about the older motors. If you have a dirty blower wheel or a, um, a dirty blower wheel is actually kind of a tricky one because that can go either way, but we'll say a dirty evaporator coil. You have a dirty evaporator coil on an ECM blower. What does the ECM blower do? Ramps up. So now you have a variable. And that variable causes that motor to run hotter and more inefficient. So those of you doing installs or working on newer equipment that has ECM motors in it, of which most of what we install nowadays, if not all, has ECM blowers, either X13 or um, true variable. And those applications, um, you're going to see an, a motor get inefficient with low airflow. And then the other side is your condenser fan motor. Your condenser fan motor, if there is a clogged um, return, clogged return, what am I talking about? My brain, is, my brain is thinking about three things at once. If there is a clogged condenser coil with a uh, prop fan that you have in a condenser, uh, that will result in higher amp draw and less efficiency. So a prop fan, what's the correct name for it? That would be a axial fan? No, a radial fan, a radial fan, a prop fan. Um, when you restrict that coil, it is going to run inefficient. So from a practical standpoint, low airflow equal bad, either way. But one of the reasons it equals bad is not just that low airflow impacts the refrigerant side of the circuit, impacts your suction pressure, all that. It also impacts your motor temperature and efficiency in most cases, other than a PSC uh, blower motor. Okay. But that was kind of an edge case. I wasn't actually even expecting to go there, but that was, was good. All right, so weak capacitors, low airflow generally. What else can cause hot and inefficient motors? Flood outs, flood outs. What else, Sam? A swirl. <sighs> that's, not a, that's not a very good answer. Yeah. I had a scroll one yesterday. The one couldn't turn off. Stuck inside the blade. <laughs> yeah. Watch out for squirrels. That'll do it. Um, another thing would be uh, bearing wear, right? Bearing. No, this is an A. That's an A. It's like a bear. Rawr. Ing. Wear. That'll cause it. Um, and so checking for <laughs> play in bearings, listening for noises, looking, looking, looking for signs of oil leaking out of the bearings. Those are all things to watch for that can be signs that signify bearing wear. What else can cause a hot inefficient motor? That's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Improper applied voltage. Meaning that anything that would cause the voltage to be either too low or too high for the motor's design can result in hot and a hot or efficient motor. You okay, Kyle? Everything all right? You're just chilling? I'm vibing. Oh, vibing. <laughs> okay. Are you, are you listening to something in your earbuds there that's like, yeah, Jim? I'm listening to you. Are you? Okay. All right. All right. It would be weird if you were in a meeting and then you were listening to a podcast, a different one that you like better. <laughs> yeah, Joe Rogan. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 what a my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going really poorly this morning. <laughs> All right, improper applied voltage. So what is one of the most common causes of improper applied voltage to a motor? And again, we're saying a motor could be a compressor motor, condenser fan motor, blower motor, any kind of motor. What's the most common cause of improper applied voltage? Low capacitor. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh boy. We can as well. A poor connection is probably the most common. But any sort of issue with the conductors <coughs> leading up to the motor. So it could be what other than a poor connection could also <coughs> cause uh, improper applied voltage, specifically low applied voltage. Transformer. Transformer, okay, under what circumstances? Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're talking about a transformer <coughs> at the road that has a problem, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> well, when he said low voltage, it sounded like 24 volts. Oh, 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 so that's so, where he went. Okay, that. that's where he went with that. So I'm saying low voltage. So I'm saying, I'm saying Not over -voltage improper, voltage. Lo, improperly low voltage applied to a motor. So we're talking the high voltage, high voltage that's too low. Let's be specific about that. Did that, did that help? I don't feel like, I don't feel I don't like, like they all that much. No, no. You know saying. what? Class is over. Give up. He was reaching Just for everybody that. leave. Improperly sized wires. Improperly sized conductors. That could cause it. Yeah. Improperly sized conductors. What else can cause that? It's not just sizing. What else? Wire length. Wire length. There we go. All right. So we've got a got a list of things here. Poor connections. Contactor. Poor connections. Wire size and length. And then a contactor or relay would be another one, which would go into the poor connection category, but. We'll put it here. <clears throat> Whatever's responsible for doing the switching, if it is adding something to the circuit that it's not supposed to be, that can cause it. And what is that something that a contactor or relay can add to the circuit that can result in a problem? Resistance. Resistance, Sparks. which is measured in what? Ohms. 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 Got it. Good. See, we got we mixed a little theory in there. You like how we did that? Wow. Wow. Um, so, and a lot of these things here are adding resistance. In fact, all of them. Four connections, wire size being too small, length being too long, contact or relay, contacts, not making good connection. Those are all things that can lead to hot and inefficient motors. And in terms of, th there's a reason why I'm doing this little exercise, and that is that I want you to get your head really clear when you're communicating to a customer specifically about these problems because a customer doesn't really care so much about the technical name for the parts that you're replacing. Um, of course, they want to know you're not scamming them, so that's why we don't make up names for things. You know, there's a new practice in our trade. I don't know if you're familiar with this, where people change the names of parts so that customers can't look them up online. Um, I'm not going to throw shade on anyone. I'm just going to say we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that is because I don't want a customer to ever feel like we're trying to take advantage of them, like we're trying to trick them with a different part name. But what we can do is focus more on the result that we're providing than the name of a part. Because ultimately, that's the reason why we're replacing a component that needs replaced, right? We don't replace a weak capacitor because weak capacitors just need replacing, right? We replace weak capacitors, why? Uh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> because, no, we replace weak capacitors because weak capacitors result in hot and inefficient Slow. motors. And ultimately, untimely failure of either the motor or the capacitor itself, right? If the capacitor is getting weak, it's also a sign that it's beginning to fail, which can result in them being without air conditioning. Because this is what the customer cares about, right? They care about their unit not drawing too much power and not breaking on them prematurely. Right? Not having a hot night, let's be specific. So, or at least not that kind of hot night, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, <laughs> no, cut no. that out. It's funny. It was a really bad joke. Uh, so, when we're talking about these problems, any of these problems, we can 
pin it to the fact that it results in a hot, inefficient motor. It results in untimely failure of the system. And that's what we're looking to prevent. And that's real. Like, it's not pretend. Now, could it be pretend? Could we tell somebody that they need a contactor when they don't need a contactor? Sure. Could we tell somebody that they need a capacitor when they don't need a capacitor? Sure. And that's what we call immoral, so we're not going to do that. But what we do is when it does need one of these things for a reason, the reason why we're presenting it to the customer is because it prevents heat and inefficiency in a motor, and that is all true, right? You don't just replace a capacitor when it's 10% low or suggest replacement because that's just a company policy. You do it because a capacitor that's 10% or more low results in a hot or inefficient and inefficient motor operation. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And in terms of what, even really what you need to know, that's almost all you need to know, frankly. I mean, we can get really into the weeds of how capacitors work and what they do and all that stuff, and that's fun and it's good, but more than anything else, just know, when a capacitor runs weak, you put one in that's too small, it results in a hot, inefficient motor, right? Cool, so I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that. So what are some things that we do on maintenances and service calls, especially in the winter, that help solve this problem? When I say especially in the winter, I'm, it's, we should do it all the time, but the reality is we have a little bit more, we can, we can spend a little bit more time on the systems, or at least we don't feel that constant pressure of the summer. Clean coils. All right, so we can, we can clean coils, look at coils, recommend cleaning, right? Those are things that can help. <coughs> Efficiency and longevity of the equipment. What else? What else? Take out the double filter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remove or <laughs> check for a double filter. Okay. That's fine. So where do you check for a double filter? In the return oh, grill. The ceiling. Yep, you check it for in the return grill and the ceiling or down low if it's, a, if it's a direct return. You look in it. Just because there isn't a filter back return grill doesn't mean that somebody didn't jam a filter in there. Because that happens a lot, right? All right, so what are some other things that you do? You check capacitors, right? We already should do that, but we check capacitors. What are the two different ways to check capacitors? Under load and not under load. Under load or not under load, otherwise called bench test. You just either unhook the wires and you use your capacitor tester or you do it under load, which is the whole, you know, the 2652 deal thing of a lobby, which some of you should probably just go ahead and use the calculator on the HVAC school app because that'll make it a lot easier so you don't have to do math. Um, but you have to know how to do it. But there's lots of videos and things on how to do that if you haven't done it before. So check capacitors. What else? Look carefully at the motors. So. If you look more carefully at motors, there's another thing that we didn't cover here, but especially on air over motors, like lower motors, even the end bell being dirty can result in that motor running hot and inefficient, right? If the motor body gets dirty and the air doesn't move through it as easily, that can cause a problem. But also looking at the motors for bearing wear. Look at them when they start to get, especially, you know, a little bit can be normal as a motor gets older, but when you see a lot of oil leakage, at the end, at the shaft end of that motor, that's an indication that that motor's losing the lubrication because that lubrication started inside the motor. Now that doesn't mean that you tell the customer, oh my gosh, you need to change this motor. But it is something, depending on the attributes of the customer, you can go ahead and mention it. There's nothing wrong with that. That is a sign of, a, of an emerging problem. And you check for shaft play. Shaft play is this way, not in and out, right? As soon as I said it, Every, there's just faces out there. It's just, <laughs> well, you did a fist with it. I, I, that's how you have to do it, unless we have a motor. We, I need to keep a motor here just for that purpose. All right. Stop it. <laughs> Every time, I'm a failure as a leader. All right. So look carefully at motors. Let's look carefully at all of our connections. <clears throat> And where is where are some of the most likely places for connections to be a problem? Top of the capacitor. Top of the capacitor, and why? Why top of the capacitor? That's where people have been taking them off. People have been taking them on and off. So 
A lot of times, poor connections at a capacitor are user-caused or technician-caused because you're pulling them on and off to test and you don't put them back on tight. Don't ever leave play in connections. Spade connections need to be hard to get on and off. If they go on easy, you need to take some needle nose, pinch them down so that way they go on snug. And what you're pinching, because this is this has come up from time to time. If you look at the if you look at the uh, look at the face of a spade or whatever you want to call that, that's what it looks like, right? You're taking your needle nose and you're pinching here and here just a little bit in order to make it grab better. Because I've seen people pinching on the sides and that doesn't do anything. Pinch here, pinch here, just a little bit. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That should be a regular thing you do. Those of you who are doing maintenances. And you feel like, oh, this is boring, I'm just doing maintenance all the time. Well, look for loose spades. That's a very useful thing you can do. Another area to check for is the contactor. We talk a lot about this. We've done a lot of demonstrations in the past about what an unacceptably pitted contactor is. What you're really looking for is voltage drop. Now, the problem is, is there's no <coughs> trade standard on what acceptable voltage drop is across the, uh, across the contactor. So you can test, you can take a contactor, we're just going to pretend this is a contactor here with our little low voltage connections here. We'll make it a, uh, a plus one pole contactor here. You can check for voltage drop while the system's running by just taking your two meter leads and going across that set of contacts. When that set of contacts is closed, meaning the unit is running, there should be next to no voltage drop across that. The problem is, is that even in millivolts, that can be, that's a problem. If you see a volt or more, yeah, definitely a problem. But the challenge is, is that there's no standard of exactly what is acceptable or unacceptable. But any amount of resistance in this contact point causes what within the contact point? Heat. So heat shows up in places of where resistance is. So when you have a poor connection and there's resistance between those wires, the carbons build up, you get heat there. And we don't want heat there. We don't want heat there for a couple reasons. One is that heat is wasted energy. But the other reason is, is that that heat is going to continue to grow as that connection gets worse and worse and more resistance builds up until the wire nut melts off, the contactor completely fails, whatever the case may be. Now some people have thought that maybe there's some correlation even between contact failure and the fact that it attracts insects or whatever. I think it's just the actual coil itself. There's something about the electromagnetic field that attracts insects. I'm really not sure why that is. Um, but that's kind of another thing. If you do ever have a customer, just as a side note, if you ever have a customer that has even one occurrence of insect-related failure, where its ants got in it or whatever, go ahead and replace that, quote them to replace it with a sealed contactor. And specifically the Emerson Sure Switch or the, uh, what's the other one called? I can't remember what it's called. But they're completely sealed. Not like, because just having a cover on it, that's ants can still usually get into those covers. It's all like a gun, I'm fine, but, but you know, we, we don't want to have a reoccurrence on that. That can be pretty frustrating for the customer. And like the Sure Switch isn't going to have that problem. But it'll also last forever too, which is nice. So, look at your contactors. When you're doing a maintenance, when you're doing a service call, if that contactor has severe wear, and this is part of just being used to looking at them. So my way of looking at it is, is this. If you are never replacing a contactor or quoting a contactor on a service call or a maintenance, then obviously you're not looking at them, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're quoting them on 50% of the maintenances that you're doing, well then you're doing something wrong in the other direction, right? So, you know, probably in our market, with as long as these, as much as these systems run, as much as they cycle, one in 10 on systems that are over six years old, that's probably you know, pretty realistic based on my experience. Anybody care to dispute that? Give me a different number, because I'm fine with that. One in seven. Alex says one in seven, all right. All right, what do you think, Bert? That's pretty good. One in seven on systems six, seven years or older. What do you think, Sam? Does that sound about right? So that means that if you're running you know, an average of four or five service calls a day, then you're going to have a couple every week. <coughs> if you're not having a couple every week, then, I mean, you could have just had a week where you didn't find any, but it's probably more likely that you're not really paying attention to contactors. Who here can say honestly 
that they pay attention to contactors pretty religiously. Good. Good. But let's get that number up. Well, installers now. Could you make a little more noise with that bottle? That'd be great. Just a little bit more. Don't answer yes. Yeah. That's good. All right. What's another place where poor connections show up a lot? Inside the lot. Inside the air handler, that is, yeah, but that actually is a good one. It wasn't one on my list, but it is a good one because there's a lot of really poorly made terminations, field-connected terminations uh, inside air handlers. Also within air handlers, just as a side note, a lot of really poorly routed wires, wires that are routed in such a way that they're going to you know, get cut or damaged or get abrasions where they run through the cabinet. So on this note, when you have high voltage coming into an air handler that was done improperly, connected improperly, connected poorly. Quote the customer to redo that. That is one of the single greatest fire hazards in a customer's house, very realistically. Now, we don't say that to the customer. We are not going to use scare tactics. You know, like, do you care about your children? Well, you better get this fixed right away because your house is about to burn down. You know, we don't use that type of language. I'm not, I'm not kidding. There are a lot. That is actually somewhat common in our trade, that sort of hyperbole, but we don't do that. But when you find something like that, point it out, quote the customer to redo it. And this is true really of all field wiring that's done poorly. If you find field wiring that's done poorly, routed improperly, um, looks like a rat's nest, just quote to redo it. Again, if you bundle this, it's much easier. In terms of bundling, yeah, yeah, and exactly. And this is, this is all within the context of bundling. Everything I'm talking about here. And not in the weird way that the Amish do it, because that's, that's really iffy, but in the way of you know, putting together, uh, uh, it, cut that out. We don't want to insult the Amish and their practices. Because <laughs> they're going to see that. Good point. Good point. The odds that there's going to be an Amish. Yeah. OK, no, you make a really good point. I guess we're probably safe. They cut out the I just realized I found a, a, a demographic we can insult on the YouTube channel, and we're safe. Everybody's moaning. You're never safe. Uh, no. No. Okay. No. All right. Cut out all Amish. Everybody insults. has an Amish friend. Or an uncle. And you just text them every once in a while. All right. Disconnects. Disconnects. That's where we're going with this. Disconnects. Focus, Brian. Disconnects are huge. So, huge. <coughs> especially on. Maintenance is look inside disconnects. Now, for some people who do not have electrical licenses, and especially in some other states, this can become iffy ground. Uh, for us, it is not iffy ground. We are allowed to look in, replace, repair, disconnects because we have an electrical license. So we're fine. You're all covered under that. So if you've got wires that are coming in that don't have bushings or you have even whips that are coming out of disconnects and they're broken off and water's getting in them or any of that sort of stuff you can quote to replace all of that bundle together with other repairs this is where these are kind of small things that you can create some added value at a discount to the customer so we want to make this a win-win but let's address the things that need addressing while we're there and there's a couple things with disconnects the number one and the easiest is the actual pull itself if it's a pull disconnect that pull, if it has damage on it, and this, and where it goes in has damage on it, then the disconnect should be quoted. When you open up that secondary uh, little cover in there, and you look at those terminals, if you see any signs of melting, arcing, whatever, that disconnect needs to be replaced. In addition to that, look and see if there's significantly smaller wires coming into it than going out of it. That's not necessarily a problem. Knowing wire size is actually pretty simple, and it's based on the MCA rating on the data tag. If you don't know how to do this, this is a whole different topic, but it's very simple to know what size wire a unit should have. But both going into the disconnect and coming out of the disconnect needs to have wire that's large enough to, you know, for that purpose. So it needs to be within the MCA rating. We'll be able to handle the MCA rating of that. Another thing with disconnects is, and a very common one, that I talk about a lot. It's a nice one to bundle in because it is such a small add-on. A lot of times the disconnects are fine, but maybe they're falling off the wall. <coughs> Remount them. That's, we should not be doing maintenances or service calls on houses that have disconnects falling off the wall where we don't address that problem. It's the same thing like a thermostat falling off the wall. Like, you know, somebody's thing's coming halfway off the wall or it's crooked. Does it affect the system for the thermostat to be crooked nowadays? No. Back in the day when they were mercury bulb, yes. 
but nowadays it doesn't, but it looks terrible. And the customer is going to blame you for not addressing even aesthetic problems. This is something we've got to get our head around that customers, home inspectors, those sorts of folks, they view aesthetic problems on the same par with technical problems. Now, we don't, and that's fine, because we're professionals and we understand the technical. But to not address a significant aesthetic problem on a piece of equipment when you're there for a maintenance, it leaves a question mark in the customer's head. So even if you say, your thermostat's falling off the wall, I'm gonna take care of that as well as part of this, it's not hurting anything, but you know, it doesn't look right. So let's let's address this, get it mounted properly. That's a good way of of saying that because you're not overstating it, but you're also not ignoring it. And disconnects fall into that same category in terms of pulling off the wall. Now, when they are pulling off the wall, that can cause a real problem. And what is the real problem that it can cause? Anybody know? Safety hazard. What's a safety hazard? Sure. Short. short. It can cause a short because you know it's flopping around in the breeze. Fill up with water. To fill up with water is the main reason. That's the one I was looking for. Because in a lot of cases, in fact, most cases, um, the wires, the high voltage conductors are coming in the back of the disconnect. I shouldn't say most, but there are a lot of cases. They're coming in the back of the disconnect. And if that's pulling off the wall, now there's openings in the back of that disconnect. So disconnect should be firmly fastened using a proper connector for whatever proper screw for whatever the, the substrate is. If it's concrete or stucco or whatever, you need to use tap bonds. If it's wood, then use wood screws, whatever, right? But then you should also seal the top down the sides of that disconnect with silicone. Okay, we've talked about this a lot. It's not hard at all. So long as you have a gun and you've got a tube of silicone and you've got one of those little caps that you put on the end of it after every time you use it immediately. Alcohol. And you have alcohol on your truck. And again, alcohol's gotten a lot easier because if you have hand sanitizer, even hand sanitizer will work just fine. Put a little hand sanitizer on your finger. It tastes just as good. What's that? Uh, it tastes just as good? Yeah. Yeah, that explains what's wrong with you. That was a joke. If you're Amish, then I can continue that joke. But. <laughs> Actually, my mom is. <laughs> is she? Oh. No, he's not. He's not <laughs> I feel bad. Gonna make fun of her jean skirts next. Alright. So using a little bit of silicone around down the top and down the sides is just a standard thing. And so anytime you see a disconnect where the wires are coming through the back and it's not sealed on the top, that's a great opportunity to add a little value, bundle it in with your other stuff that you're doing, and you know, gives a little extra benefit. Because it is a real thing. In fact, a lot of problems with disconnects corroding out happen because of water getting into them. Water and electricity ain't buddies. You know, they were friends in high school, but they had falling out, got ugly, they don't talk anymore. You know, I think water tried to steal electricity's girl. That's the story that I heard. All right, tried to focus here. Um, another thing that I want you to. Another thing that I want you to look at that we've talked a lot about, and this will be kind of the finishing thing, which is just a little side note, are uh, float switches and issues related with float switches and the drains at the air handler. So horizontal portions of drains at air handler not insulated. That's something that should be addressed because they do sweat. Um, drains improperly pitched at the air handler. So if a drain is perfectly level and there is a way to get it pitched properly, that's something that should be redone. A lot of times you'll see that where it's perfectly level right here, but then when it goes back and returns, there's plenty of space. They could have pitched it more, you know, and that's going to result in a better long-term result. Systems that don't have float switches, that's a big one. Float switches improperly wired, that's a big one. Float switches that aren't working, they're not shutting the system off, that's a big one. So that's another thing to be looking at regularly. So, in terms of summary, things to look for, things that cause hot and inefficient motors, weak capacitors, airflow problems, bearing wear, poor connections. Um, now again, in terms of something that I want you to check regularly, I do want you to check the voltage on equipment while it's running. That is a really good test to do. In fact, it's more practical for most purposes than even measuring amp draw. Because it's very rare that we're going to replace a component strictly based on amp draw. That's very rare. But often you will find low or high applied voltage and that's something to investigate further.
high applied voltage happens because the power company is just applying too high voltage, which is something that they've been doing a lot lately. Um, and we can deal with that by using a buck and boost transformer. And again, that only is something that we really do care enough about when it's, you know, infinity systems, systems that have inverter drives in them um, that can be affected by that over voltage condition. Connections, again, spade connections, <coughs> and then uh, spend a lot of time looking at disconnects as well. A lot more time than we are. That's, a, that's one, that, in, in terms of things, a lot of this stuff you're already doing, but in terms of things that I know that probably most of you aren't doing is paying attention to the disconnects, and that's a big one going into this next season. Because again, what is our goal here? Our goal here is to provide the customer with significant value for the work that we provide. We don't want to walk away from a customer's house either having not provided them a value or having them feel like we didn't provide them a value. You know, where we just did a bunch of checks and we didn't actually do anything in their mind. And so doing things like washing coils really well when they need it, doing things like, we've talked about in terms of maintenance, cleaning the bottoms out of condenser coils, doing things like fixing wire abrasions, doing things like whips that are improperly done or disconnects that are coming off the wall and taking care of that. Um, insulation, pulling off of air handler panels, fastening that better, taping it in place. Um, checking uh, float switches, checking capacitors, those are all things that add value. Because our goal is to prevent that system from failing, number one, and number two, to keep it running efficiently so that the power bills aren't going up. Cool? Any questions? No? Nope. The latest video on the HVAC School YouTube channel has Sam in it, if anybody wants to listen to that. He's a real all-star, this guy. Yeah.